Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Today on By the Book, Kim Butler interviews professor of psychology Nancy Boyd Franklin about her book, Boys into Men, Raising Our African-American Teenage Sons. I'm Kim Butler. Welcome to By the Book. The authors of the new book, Boys into Men, write that it is both a gift and a challenge to raise an African-American teenage son. Throughout history, black parents have had to guide their sons to adulthood in the face of slavery, lynching, limited opportunities, and multiple other forms of racism. While we have come a long way on some fronts, today we are dealing with new and often deadly challenges that can seem overwhelming to many parents. My guest today, psychologist and professor Nancy Boyd Franklin, is co-author of Boys Into Men, which provides parents with practical advice for successfully guiding their African-American sons into adulthood. Dr. Boyd Franklin, welcome to Buy the Book. Hi. This is a wonderful book. I will just start out by saying this. It's, it's very practical. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about your own uh, training and preparation for writing this. You're a therapist, a researcher, and a parent. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you if any of these were particularly influential in moving you to write this book. Oh, yes. I think the biggest influence, Kim, was being a parent. I am a parent and a step-parent, now a grandparent. Uh, my uh, older kids are 31 to 36, and our youngest is 18. And what we found as parents, we have two um, men and two women. They tell me they are no longer boys and girls. But um, what they have taught us is that there are challenges in raising both. But what we found as African-American parents is that the challenge of raising sons is just very different from anything that even our training and preparation could have prepared us for. Um, we work with many. The second issue is really that we are both, my husband and I co-authored the book, and we've worked with many, um, I'm a family therapist and a psychologist, so I work with many families. And what I hear repeatedly from African American parents is that they are afraid for their sons. Um, and that's a rather, I guess the other issue that made me personally and my husband also want to write this book, we are both academics. We write books for the academic audience. I've written a number. But we had always wanted to write a book that would reach the African American community directly. So this book is written for academics if they choose to read it, but also um, many in the psychology and social work field, but also parents, ministers, teachers, members of the community who are concerned about the future of our black sons. And it's and uh, it's very important. Um, let me ask you this: You just touched on it. We understand that teenage teenage years are difficult anyway. But you're looking at what makes it particularly difficult for African American teenage males. Yes. What are some of those things that make it so particularly difficult for them? Yes. I think there are many, many challenges. You know, um, many uh, people would like to believe that racism is dead and gone. I'm here to tell you it is alive. And here in New Jersey, one of the challenges has always been racial profiling. You know, I laughed when um, and cried when um, a couple of years ago this big issue was made of racial profiling on the New Jersey Turnpike. My, we tell in the book the story of our older son, who is now 32 and married, 
And when he was returning from Howard University, driving up the New Jersey Turnpike, we had to prepare him and his friends for being stopped as African American men simply because of the color of their skin. Um, so those issues of racial profiling, the external issues are very different from the issues that parents of other ethnic groups and other racial groups face. And one of the things you do also is, as you just gave us a story about your own son, you've really pulled these issues out of what people have told you. Oh, yes. It's not just things that you were just making up a list and oh, going no. out and finding them. Because you talked to many, many people, right? Yes. And we drew this book from our own qualitative research. We drew it interviews with parents and grandparents, by the way. In our community, it's not just parents, but grandparents and lots of other family members who are helping to raise our sons. Um, but we also are active family therapists. We had many, many families we've helped. And we wanted to draw from our own experience as parents. We wanted to speak in that voice to those in our community who were trying to help um, these kids. And in addition to your own experience as a professional, you've also got a lot of ancient wisdom oh, yes. in the book, some not so ancient. Throughout the book, you begin it with African proverbs and those proverbs and quotes and inspirational messages are just sort of interspersed yes. throughout the book. Why was that important to include? Well, it was very important. One of the messages, every chapter begins with either an African proverb or a saying or quotation from a famous African American. And that was very important to us. We really wanted to give parents and community members and kids themselves a very direct message that they have to be trained in who they are. They have to know their African roots and their African American roots. If they are to become solid, grown, um, mature human beings who have a strong racial identity. And that was very important to us. It's true as parents, but it's also, I think, uh, it's been demonstrated in the field of psychology that high positive racial identity correlates with high self-esteem. And the church, you say, has been a very important institution, uh, and you consider it, its relevance today for helping to, to foster those goals. But yet, you're really careful about not specifying any one denomination. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about the way you understand spirituality as an anchor in terms of helping raise these boys. Yes. Well, you know, I. In my first book, Black Families in Therapy, um, which is a book really trying to reach the psychology and social work community, um, I talked about the influence of spirituality and religion in terms of the psyche of people of African descent. You know, in African culture, the as you know from your studies, uh, the psyche and the spirit and the body are all one. One does not, you know, divide them in the way that we do in Eurocentric research. And so I really wanted to convey the power that the black church and separate from religion, the issue of spirituality, has for many black people who may not even practice a formal religion. Um, we wanted to reach and I wanted to convey in this book that spirituality is not just something that began yesterday in the black community. It goes back to our African roots. It's helped us survive. It's a survival mechanism. It's helped us survive slavery. It's helped us survive Jim Crow and discrimination and segregation. It can help us survive raising teenage sons. Well, let's look at some of those uh, issues that you touch on in the book. One of the things that you really get to early on is the home and the family environment uh, in terms of raising these boys. What are some of the things that parents need to do to provide a good foundation for these Well, one kids? of them we've just talked about, which is to provide them with a spiritual foundation that can be, we call it an inoculation. You know, you give your kids shots when they're babies to protect them from all of the germs that are out in the world. Well, we need to inoculate African-American children so that they can be prepared for what they will encounter in the world. 
Uh, and spirituality is a big inoculation. The other is knowing who they are, this sense of a positive, strong African uh, racial identity that um, undergirds their ability to deal with many of the influences. In the book, um, we use a, a term um, looking at a minefield that, um, you know, the teenage years for any kids are a minefield. But for African American males, there are so many things, um, drugs, alcohol, often violence, random violence, gang violence, um, issues of, uh, you know, we joke about hip hop and rap, but for many of our kids, those are their role models. And so for many parents, what we found was that we needed to give them a way or ways to just address those issues and prepare their children for the world out there. And you, you also give some very practical things. Oh, yes. You give a checklist. You ask, uh, are you treating sons and daughters? Oh, yes. Uh, equally, I mean, do boys know how to cook? Well, but that's an interesting issue. There is an old saying in the African-American community. It's a very sexist saying, but it's very uh, relevant in our community. And that is that uh, parents, mothers in particular, often uh, raise our daughters and love our sons. Now, that doesn't mean we don't love our daughters, but in some households, what that translates into is that our male children are not being expected to step up to the plate, to be mature, to be responsible. And so there's a section in the book on the um, responsibility quiz. What we want to find out is, you know, do you require him to get up himself in the morning or do you wake him? Do you require him to do his own laundry? You know, do you require him to get a job in the summers after school? Do you uh, expect him to cook? Do you expect him to know how to clean? You know, some of the basic things that I'm sure many of us experienced growing up. Um, but we feel it's very important that this be given not just to our daughters, but to our sons also. Now, you say that that's an old uh, tradition mm -hmm. in African-American families. Another one that you touch on is discipline and spanking. Oh, yes. Which we know that uh, in a lot of black families, people were raised and they always say, and you mentioned, mm -hmm. say, well, I was spanked and I came out all right. Right. What is your, you advise against that, though. Yes. Why? Well, we're, we're cautioning parents. First of all, this is a book about raising teenage sons. Many African-American families have never learned any other way of discipline. By the time your child is 14, 15, or 16 and bigger than you, if your main form of discipline is spanking, you are in deep trouble. And so we are very concerned that our parents learn other methods of discipline. Um, you know, the history of spanking is interesting. Um, in the black community, it was a way that parents tried to protect their kids. The feeling was, I will discipline you so society won't. And so, you know, I mean, for African-American males going back many, many years, stepping off the line often meant things like lynching, things like jail time. Uh, and so one of the things that we were very concerned about is to help African-American parents recommend, recognize that there are other ways, you know, uh, to acknowledge that tradition. I was spanked as a child. Um, but to really know that there are other ways to discipline. One last thing before we go to break, uh, you just again referred to African-American parents. One of the changing demographics in this country is that not all parents of African-American boys are African-American themselves. Yes. And uh, do you make any specific recommendations as to how they might be able to help instill uh, that cultural grounding that you talk about? Yeah. Uh, the book was not really intended for parents who are not African-American, but we say in our foreword that uh, we feel that this book will be a help to anyone who is raising a child of African descent that uh, I think what many parents don't realize is that they have to teach their kids about their culture. And if they don't know their culture, they need to find other ways to expose their sons to a solid black identity. 
All right. Well, listen, we're going to be getting into more of this book, especially I'd like to continue on with some of the challenges, the solutions, and some of the questions people might have about them. My guest is Nancy Boyd Franklin, co-author of Boys Into Men, Raising Our African-American Teenage Sons. We'll be right back. The last book I read was written by Matthew Shepard, and it is a biography of Arshiel Gorky, the painter. It was a fabulous book about uh, the life of the artist and the art world in the 30s and 40s and 50s in New York. Uh, Gorky was a victim of the Armenian Holocaust, came to live in New York because of that, and participated in a very exciting time in the art world there. I would recommend this book to anybody that's interested in the arts and interested in uh, sort of the pre-abstract expressionist time period because they'll get a, a tremendous insight into uh, the artist's life. Welcome back. My guest is Nancy Boyd Franklin, co-author of Boys Into Men, Raising Our African-American Teenage Sons. When we left, we were just beginning to get into some of the specific challenges that you talk about in your book. And I'd like to get right to education. Yes. You uh, cite Jawanza Kanjufu's work that talks about this fourth grade syndrome that turns really engaged young boys into just uh, folks that just don't really feel the same way about school. Can you talk a little bit about yes. that and what can be done about it? Yes. What Kunjufu talks about, and we um, elaborate on this in our book, um, is the fact that for many African American boys, they start off school enthusiastic. They are verbal, they are um, delighted to learn, they are eager to learn, and then something begins to happen. Around third or fourth grade, um, they are perceived as a threat by many of their teachers. Uh, many teachers don't know how to respond to the exuberance that they bring to learning. Uh, and what starts to happen is many of our kids get labeled. You begin to see labeling 70% um, of the kids in special education programs throughout this country are minority children. And a significant percentage of those are African-American males. And so what starts to happen around third, fourth grade, as they become bigger and they are perceived in this way, um, teachers begin to respond to them very differently. Different expectations, uh, expecting less of them. Um, they often get referred for special um, testing for special education at that point. A disproportionate number are labeled hyperactive and are now on Ritalin. And what we advise African American parents and frankly teachers, ministers, community members is to really be very vigilant about that process and very proactive and involved in their child's educational in, in their educational process so that they can observe if those kinds of um, disparities are beginning to happen to their child. And, and that's an emphasis that you make throughout the book that while you recognize the forces that are acting against these boys, you're also cautioning against taking this, you know, victim mentality Absolutely. only, but rather really emphasizing the actions that people can take. The purpose of this book is empowerment. We really want anyone a social worker, a teacher, uh, a psychologist, to be able to take this book and use it directly to empower African American families to really um, help their kids do well. You, uh, there's another issue that you get into in education that we don't talk about a whole lot, no. and that is this whole equating of school with a white space yes. so that people who do well in school, the ones that we should really be celebrating as the successes, are accused of 
acting right. And what kind of, uh, and you also mentioned a strategy mm -hmm. that people take, which is becoming raceless. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and what comes out of trying to, to pursue this raceless strategy? And maybe what some people can do if they're sort of caught in that trap. I mean, we do have a big yeah. college audience watching yeah. us today, so. Well, this is a big peer group issue, and I'm sure a lot of the folks here in college at Rutgers now went through this in high school. What happens is that for many African-American kids, and this is particularly true for our males, um, the peer group gives a message that if you're smart, you're not black, all right? And so what starts to happen over a number of years is that kids hide how smart they are. Um, my own son tells me the way he balances it is that he plays basketball. And he's a good basketball player, so it's okay to be smart. Um, but uh, Kunjufu, in his book, talks about many strategies that kids use. Kids often become the clown, all right? They hide their scores so other kids don't know how well they're doing. All right. And so what starts to happen is that the message from the peer group is that if you're smart, if you do well in school, if you're in the honors program, you're acting white. And um, what we want to do is to begin reversing that strategy in our schools. Now, raceless strategy is one form of an approach. Frankly, we don't advocate it. Um, that, that's based on the work of um, Signethia Fordham and John Ogbu. And what they found in their research was that some kids begin to pretend as if they are not African American. That is not what we're advising kids to do. But it is a, an adjustment that adolescents make to this kind of mes message from their peers. The other thing, though, that we find is that um, we encourage parents to really find positive peer groups that can encourage their children to achieve. You know, right here on campus, we have an Upward Bound program where kids are lauded and praised for their academic achievements. You know, many of our Rutgers students now volunteer in the community. Um, and I'd like to encourage any of you listening, if you're interested, let me know. Contact me uh, at Gazap on Bush Campus. Because many of our community organizations, churches and schools, are desperately looking for positive black mentors for our kids. So I really hope that you realize how special it is that you've gotten to college. The numbers of African American males in college are going down. And we suspect that one of the reasons is this message about um, it not being black to achieve. And also you mentioned the peer group, and I want to just probe that a little bit further because, you know, being cool is an African-American value that we really prize. And, mm -hmm. and in this generation, which is really the hip-hop generation, there's certain particular things that make up, you know, what's acceptable, what's sort of celebrated. And is there a way that you can uh, recommend for people to help balance the need to do well with the need to be cool? I mean, is, there, yeah. is it a yeah. trade-off, or can you kind of work the two together? Yeah. I think kids learn how to work the two yeah. together. I've met tons of undergrads here on Rutgers campus who are here because they learned how to balance the two. They learned how to have a way of being in their communities, um, being hip, being able to um, listen to hip hop and rap, talk the talk, but also being able to achieve. I believe it's possible, many of our kids do, um, but they need role models. And that's where so many of our uh, young men and women of African descent on this campus could be a real help okay, to African American and kids. So they will be contacting you at the oh, yes. Graduate School of Applied Psychology. But we, I really want to get into some of the, uh, the fears that people face when they read this because you focus on prevention. Yes. But we have a lot of times where people come into a situation where you might even think it's too late. The kid has already gone over the edge. They yes. might have been in jail. They might have been involved in some kind of incidents. How can you uh, step into a situation? Is there a point where it's a point of no return? Hmm. Or is there always something that you can do? 
I was raised by a person who believed that the glass was always half full, and that optimism translates into my approach to the world. As a family therapist, I tell families I believe that it is never too late to intervene. Now, there's a catch, though. In our communities, we are very suspicious of counseling and other forms of help. And so we, in the book, have a whole chapter on getting past our fear as a people of treatment, of therapy, of counseling, of help. And what we advise families are, uh, is very clearly how to get help when you need it. Um, every chapter in this book has not only books as references, but organizations, the Association of Black Psychologists, the Association of Black Social Workers, websites, phone numbers, addresses, yes. that a parent or a concerned, you know, many of our students on campus have brothers and sisters who didn't make it here to campus. That's right, and, uh, and as you point out, a lot of the people who can use this book are not just parents. Oh, yes. It can be older siblings, oh. cousins, uncles, aunts, and, I, and, and the point you make about the resources is very important. One last thing I'm going to ask you, though, is some of the people who want to help are going to say, I don't have time hmm. to do all the things she says. Yes. I work hard, I'm tired, I have other kids, and I cannot be bothered with this knucklehead, yes. you know? Yeah. <laughs> maybe they, yeah. they even really care about yeah. the person, they don't feel so badly. How is that person going to find the time to do the things that you suggest? You know, that's where help becomes so important. Now, I'm not just talking about professional help. Uh, there have been generations of single parents in our communities, but they did not raise their children alone. Uh, in the African American community, there's a history of many people helping to raise kids. You know, I had a grandmother, aunts, uncles, neighbors, all kinds of folk, church family who helped raise me. And our message to parents is don't be alone. Don't feel you have to do all of this by yourself. You know, get his cousin who's on Rutgers campus to come home and talk to him when he's not listening to you. You know, um, contact your sister and see if she'll talk to her yeah. if you're not getting through. You and know, even what you just mentioned about Rutgers campus, do you know a lot of black boys have never been on a college campus? Absolutely. And so just to visit yeah. helps yeah. because you're making things concrete. You also say something, though, about when all else fails, there's still one place you can yes, turn. Yes, yes. Uh, it's very important to me. Um, as you know from my scholarly books, I introduced into the mental health field the whole concept of our spirituality and our religious orientation as African Americans being just essential to who we are and to our survival. And it is essential to our survival in terms of helping us raise our kids, too. And so we have a whole chapter. It's called, No One Can Uproot the Tree Which God Has Planted. And it often helps parents to know that joy comes in the morning, you know. Well, listen, we, that is a perfect way to end this. And uh, I, I will leave you with that last word, Dr. Boyd Franklin. I'd like to thank my guest, uh, Nancy Boyd Franklin, co-author of Boys Into Men, Raising Our African-American Teenage Sons, a wonderful book that you all have to go get. Thank you so much. I'm Kim Butler, and thanks for joining us on By the Book. <laughs>